Hello, welcome to some video notes. Today we'll be talking about 1.3 and we'll be going into the specific parts of a cell membrane and how a cell membrane is going to function to do its different roles based on its different functions. So we'll be spending a lot of time talking about different structures and then how those structures allow a membrane to do what it's supposed to do. So in this video, we're actually going to cover a lot of the 1.3 contents. We'll be looking at uh, U1, talking about phospholipids and how they form a membrane. we we'll U2, talking about the membrane proteins and what they do. And we'll also be talking about the importance of cholesterol and what it is for in the membrane and how it helps with fluidity. And we'll talk a little bit about the um, <coughs> fluid mo model and how it might be drawn uh, if you're asked to draw it on a test or use it to help answer a question. And then we'll get into the other ones in another video. So when we talk about the idea of a membrane, we're really talking about what we call a phospholipid bilayer. And so phospholipids are these important structures that we're going to talk about um, in the cell membrane. And when we talk about a bilayer, we're talking about the idea of having two layers of this membrane. And so actually, when we look at a cell, we have one layer of membrane that's on the outer part, and then we have an, a second part on the inside. So we have what a, a bilayer, a double membrane. So this is the official outside of our cell. There's a, that's the official outside, or this is the official inside of the cell. And so there's this region in between here, between these two layers, which is a hydrophobic zone. And so we're going to talk about how this membrane actually forms from these phospholipids. And so it, the first thing it's leading into is, well, before we even talk about how a phospholipid for or how phospholipids form this structure, think about just what happens when oil mixes with water. And so you've probably seen uh, some type of, you know, device in someone's desk or something, or maybe you've even seen um, a balsamic dressing, vinaigrette dressing that has oil and water components. And so if you let it sit long enough, um, the oil and water will separate from each other. And if you want to, you know, use the material, you're supposed to shake it up, you know, to help remix the oil with the water a little bit better so that, you know, you get good tasting dressing, just not a whole bunch of oil. So the thing is, is that oil and water tend not to mix because oils, um, when they form this little droplet circular thing that we see on this image, uh, that is because they are hydrophobic. Actually, all lipids, all things that would be considered lipids in biological molecules, are to a certain extent hydrophobic. And hydrophobic, if we break that word down, uh, hydro is referring to water, and phobic is like a phobia. So like if you have a arachnophobia, you are afraid of spiders, right? Arachna is a spider, and phobia is a fear of. So a, mo a molecule that is hydrophobic is fearing water. It fears water in the sense that it tries to get away from water as much as possible. Water is not hydrophobic. Water is a polar molecule, so we say it is hydrophilic. All right, or sorry, not water is hydrophilic, but any molecule that likes to mix with water is hydrophilic. Philic or philia means to love something, to like something. So um, hydrophilic is any m uh, molecule that mixes with water very, very well. For example, um, simple sugars like sucrose and glucose, and, you know, stuff that you put in your drinks to make them sweeter, those would be hydrophilic. Uh, salts are hydrophilic. When you add salts to water, they break apart and they dissolve into their individual pieces. They are hydrophilic. And this comes from the idea of something being polar versus nonpolar, or something being charged or not being charged. And we're going to talk in more details about the charges of water and the properties of water a little bit later in another um, series of notes and another section of a PPT. So when we talk about a nonpolar thing, it does not have any charges on it, where if it's a polar thing, it does have charges on it. And we have this rule in chemistry and biology as well, which is like dissolves like. So nonpolar things can dissolve nonpolar things. Polar things can dissolve polar things, but they don't really mix very well together. Polar and nonpolar do not mix. So if we have a polar material like sugar and we add it to water, which is also polar, well, then the sugar mixes with the water and makes a nice solution. If we have an oil, like we see in this picture, there's oil droplets here, 
Uh, if we mix it with water, it's going to form these little droplets because it won't mix with the water. It's going to form a little meniscus or a little bubble in order to try to hide itself away from the water as much as possible in a stable form. However, if we were to add this oil to another oil, like if this was vegetable oil and we mixed it with you know, um, crude oil, like car oil, they would mix together fairly well. And so nonpolar things would mix with nonpolar things. So the structure that you're seeing in this image, these little bubbles of oil, that's coming from the idea that all of the individual parts of the oil, individual molecules of the oil droplet, are trying to avoid being around the water, away from the water as much as possible. So they form a little sphere to kind of like surround themselves from the water as much as possible. So here on the outside, even though there's kind of strange colors, here on the outside we would see that this would be a bunch of water, right? But on the inside, this would be mostly oil, right? And so it's kind of con con condensing together in order to try to be creating a stable structure that limits its exposure to water as much as possible. So the oil that's on the very inside of this isn't really interacting with the water very much, and the oil that's on the very, very outside of this bubble is the only part that's really interacting with the water. And so that's where we get this nice stable structure like this. And this is important for when we talk about how did living things come to exist, because this is a natural process. You don't need a living thing to cause this to happen. This is just how oil forms when it's surrounded by water, when a nonpolar thing forms when it's surrounded by a polar material. It's a, it's a natural occurrence. So even though all different types of oils will form those little bubbles when mixed with a uh, non, or when I sit put into a polar solution like water, uh, when we talk about a cell membrane, we're not talking about any lipid. We're talking about a very specific lipid. When this lipid, you actually need to memorize its structure and understand its structure very, very well. So this is what we call a phospholipid, and this is a phospholipid right here. So an individual phospholipid. And a phospholipid has two important points. So a phospholipid is going to be charged. It's going to be slightly, slightly polar. It's mostly nonpolar, but it's going to be slightly polar. So it has a region here, which is called a hydrophilic head, right? So it's got a section of it that is hydrophilic, that actually doesn't mind interacting with water. It enjoys being around water. And then it has another section here, which is the hydrophobic tail. And so the hydrophobic tail, being hydrophobic, is trying to keep away from the water as much as possible. And so because of these two properties, if we put them together in a solution, right, around water, they will form this natural structure here, which is called a bilipid membrane, all right? And so they do that because what happens is that all of the hydrophobic sections right, the hydrophobic heads, they're all going to line up and face outwards towards the water because they actually enjoy being around the water. Where all of the hydrophobic sections, the tails that are in the middle, they're going to move into the middle because in the middle there's not going to be any water. They're going to only be surrounded by other hydrophobic sections, other parts of a lipid. So by surrounding them, by making this structure, all right, this double layer, they are being the most stable. All the hydrophilic sections are facing towards the water. All the hydrophobic sections are away from the water. And so this naturally forms this bilipid membrane. And that's, again, important. So we don't need a living thing to create the membrane. If we have a bunch of phospholipids in a solution, they themselves just line up in this stable structure because it is the most stable. It's the way that their chemistry becomes the most stable structure. So it's important to remember that they have this structure of a hydrophilic head where they have a hydrophobic tail. And these hydrophobic tails, we can show them in different ways. We can show them here as like little jaggedy lines, which represents fatty acid tails, which we'll talk more about in another um, unit. Uh, and normally one we kind of show as being very straight and one of them having a little bit of a, of a kink to the side. And we'll talk about uh, why those help with the membrane's fluidity in just a little bit. But these are the phospholipids, and they are responsible for the formation of a cell membrane, the natural structure uh, that forms to create a cell. So when this happens, when we get a bunch 
the phospholipids together. That's where we get this idea of emergent properties again. So hopefully you remember emergent properties from earlier in this topic one. So these are properties that are gained uh, by having all of these individual parts working together. So it's a property beyond what the individual part might have by itself, right? And so by having this emergent properties, by having all these phospholipids, we can get different types of truck structures. We can get a, what we call a micelle. And a micelle basically forms when the phospholipids are in a small enough concentration that the entire inside section is all hydrophobic tails. And all the hydrophilic heads are all on the outside. All right, so it's completely full of fat material. So small little globlets of fat would be uh, something like that. Or we can form what we call a lysosome, or liposome, sorry, not lysosome, a liposome. And a liposome is what our cells would be made out of. So we have a complete bilipid structure. So we have a layer of hydrophilic heads on the outside. We have a layer of hydrophilic heads that are on the inside. And then in the middle of those two layers, we have completely hydrophobic sections. So there's all the phospholipids facing towards the middle. The tails sections are all towards the middle. So you could have um, water here, right? There can be water there, there can be water here, right? But there is no water in between those two layers. And that's really what a cell will be built from. So our cells are comprised of a liposome, a liposome uh, and we use a lot of different liposomes inside the cell. So uh, the Golgi body, for example, those vesicles that it uses to send things around the cell would be made of different little liposomes. The lysosomes are also made of liposomes, right? But there also can be certain circumstances where we're just storing things, other fat material. So maybe a micelle would be used rather than a liposome. It really depends on the situation. Uh, but most of the time, we were talking about structures, lipid or membrane brown structures in a cell. It's going to be a liposome. So because of this structure, if we think about it in terms of a 3D representation, here's what we're meaning when a liposome is the formation of our cell. So here would be the, the outside, right? And then here would be our inside of our cell, right? So my cell versus the liposome. So this, this property goes all around in all directions, even though we often draw it as a two-dimensional structure, like a section of a membrane like this, uh, this idea extends into this, where it's a three-dimensional structure going in all directions. And so that's how we get the structure of a, of a, of a cell. So the reason why the plasma membrane is so good at being a gatekeeper is that it is quite difficult. Because of this hydrophobic section that's in the middle, it's not easy for material to move through the membrane this way, all right? Because the hydrophobic section will block it. So for example, glucose, right? So I've got some glucose here. Glucose is hydrophilic, so it can move around all around in the water on the outside of the cell but it can't pass through the membrane very easily because it's one, it's really big and it's not easy to pass through something, uh, you know, these phospholipids if you're a very large molecule. And two is because glucose can't pass through this hydrophobic section in the middle. It gets pushed away. So that means that because of this hydrophobic section in the middle, the cell has some control over what can come into the cell and what will leave the cell. And we're going to talk about that when we talk about all the different ways that cells use um, proteins in order to transport things in and out of the cell. But what we want to focus on for the rest of this video is we want to talk about the different things that we find inside of the, the cell membrane and what their roles are. What are they supposed to do to keep the cell uh, happy and healthy and maintain homeostasis? So our first thing here is just thinking about the general structure. So the structure of the membrane comes from these phospholipids. And as we move from slide to slide, we're going to add more information into the membrane, in between those phospholipids, more structures that do different things. So even though the plasma membrane uh, diagram you just saw looks quite simple, it's actually not really what the plasma membrane looks like. We actually add a whole bunch of extra materials that help keep the membrane functioning because really the membrane is just a barrier so we have to be able to help the cell stick the things we have to help the cell communicate we have to help the cell with motion we have to help the cell with transporting things in and out of the membrane and we also have to help the cell keep the membrane fluid right we have to make sure that it's not too rigid so that it breaks easily or you know if it's too fluid it starts
starts to fall apart, if it's too rigid, it's, it can break very easily when the cell maybe get, takes some damage from something. So there's all these other structures you need to learn about. So first off, we have some protein channels. And so our transport protein channels are therefore responsible for helping us to move things in and out of the cell because the membrane acts as a really good barrier. We're going to spend a whole topic on different types of transport and the different types of proteins that we find in cell membrane that are responsible for doing uh, just transport by itself. We have things like glycoproteins. Now let me highlight as I go. So we've got uh, transport channels. Right? We've got glycoproteins. So glyco coming from the idea of glycogen, like carbohydrate, and protein meaning proteins. So it is a combination of sugars and proteins that is stuck into the membrane. And it's normally there for some type of communication or sometimes even um, uh, sticking to certain things. We have cholesterol and glypo glycolipids. So cholesterol, we're going to spend a lot of information about, but it's this tiny little lipid. It's even smaller than a phospholipid, right? Very, very small, and it's there to help uh, both increase the fluidity of a membrane, but also increase its stability by not making it too fluid. It's really has some interesting properties. And then we have a glycolipid, which just like a glycoprotein, a glycolipid is a combination of sugar and a lipid, which, which is a fat, uh, and so it's stuck into the membrane and again is responsible there for adhesion and communication for the cell. Now when we talk about our different types of proteins, there's two different categories we could have. We can have a peripheral protein, which means it's a protein that only goes through one side of the membrane. So here you can see this membrane, or this protein here, is only on the inner part, the inner part of the membrane, right? So that means it would be peripheral. It doesn't go all the way through the membrane. It's just a peripheral protein. Where the other category is called an integral protein. And so integral proteins, normally like a protein channel here, uh, they go all the way through both membranes. And so one part of the membrane sticks, or one protein sticks on the both sides of the membrane. So a lot of transport proteins are going to be our uh, peripheral pro or in integral proteins as well. So um, these are just, you know, a lot of the important structures that we're going to learn about. And we're going to go through some more important details for them. So our integral proteins, those are the ones permanently embedded and they mostly go all the way through, all right, penetrating both sides of the membrane, being polytopic, or sometimes they might only go through one side, but they're heavily embedded in the protein. So if they're polytopic, if they go all the way through, or monotopic, if they're really only sticking out one side, but they are all the way into the membrane, so they don't really uh, get removed from the membrane or uh, very much, they're, they're permanently put part there. Where a peripheral protein normally is temporarily there, uh, it's normally on one side or the other. It's a monotopic uh, protein, and it's maybe there because of some changes in the cell for one particular time period or some environmental change that the cell has to react to, but it doesn't stay there for very long because it's not permanently invented into the membrane. It's just kind of added to it when needed. And so we're looking at Regulation, so our integral proteins and peripheral proteins, they're for doing lots of uh, regulating of different chemical reactions. And we could also see them doing a lot of different type of communication. All right, regulating also for transport as well, regulating what's inside and outside of the cell would go under regulation or a specific task. And communication, of course, being able for the cell to gain information about the environment around it and for cells to be able to communicate with other cells that are around it uh, if they're forming a tissue. Next, we can have things like our glycoproteins, which again are made of mostly carbosaccharides uh, or oligosaccharides or a little bit of saccharides, a little bit of sugars, not a whole bunch, but not like a polysaccharide, and some protein. And they're mostly there for some cell recognition, for example, your immune system and for hormones to um, use in your body. So we're looking more at communication and connecting um, multiple cells to each other so that they can, uh, can interact and um, uh, you know, get those emergent properties that we've talked about. An important thing would be like your immune system. So every single one of your cells has these glycoproteins that are present on the outside on their cell membranes. And that tells the white blood cells in your body that they should be there, that they are part of this big organism that is you. And so as the white blood cells are moving through your blood and moving through your tissue, if they come across a cell that doesn't have enough of these glycoproteins that they're supposed to match up with receptors on the white blood cell, the white blood cell then determines, oh, 
this has to be a, a foreign cell. This is a cell like a bacterial cell maybe or a virus, something that got into the body that's not supposed to be there. And so then it will uh, go through a process called phagocytosis where it will kill the bacterial cell to stop it from reproducing inside of the body and uh, causing illnesses. And so we'll get into more details about your immune system uh, and, and a, a long way from now, uh, next year, we get to topic six. So there's a lot of different functions that the cell can be, or the cell membrane can be responsible for. And so to help organize them in your brain, uh, remember we have like Miss H. Grant or Mr. H. Grant, when we talk about the properties and functions of a cell. Um, we have Tracy to try to remember all of the different things that a cell membrane can be responsible for. So T would represent the idea of transport, so our transport proteins that help move things in and out of the cell. R would be like receptors, so there will be um, membrane-bound hormones and proteins that receive information from these hormones um, as they move through the body. So uh, insulin and glucagon, which are really important for regulating the amount of sugar that's in your blood, uh, they are going to be interacting with receptors in the membrane of cells inside of your body. Anchorage, or the idea of holding on to things, so your cell has to be able to move things around inside of it, and so it has to kind of anchor at points um, different parts of itself um, to create kind of like a, a railroad system or like a highway system of, of uh, fibers on the inside of the cell. And so those fibers can then used as like little highways for proteins to kind of, or enzymes to kind of walk along and move things from one side to the other. And so this network of like cables that support the structure of your cell, uh, they have to be attached to something. And so they will attach to the nice strong cell membrane uh, that's all around the cell. Uh, we can have cell recognition, right? So our glycoproteins, like I just said, so your immune system is able to detect uh, whether or not you have a cell that should be inside of your body or not uh, through cell recognition. We have intercellular joining, which is a little bit more specific. These would be things like tight junctions in animal cells and plasma desmata in um, plant cells. So tight junctions are like sections of tissue where the cells are so closely connected to each other uh, that there is no space for material to move through them. So for example, your digestive system uh, looks a lot like this where the walls of your digestive system are so closely connected uh, by these proteins that there's no way for material to pass through from the outside of your, your body, which is your digestive tract, into like your blood, uh, which is technically the inside of your body, uh, without moving through a cell first. So this helps make like, you know, waterproof, or you could um, think of it in terms of waterproof, uh, sections of your body where material can't go from one place to another. It has to move through a cell specifically to go from one place to another because there's no space between the cells. So that's what a tight junction is for. And we'll get into more details about these different things um, as we go through different topics. So we just want to uh, help you just remember the different uh, general um, uh, roles that a membrane has. And then we'll get into the details that I'm bringing up now later. And then we have uh, enzyme activity for E. So a lot of metabolism, a lot of chemical reactions are regulated by enzymes inside of the cell membrane. Uh, so this, the enzymes don't just have to be floating around in the cytoplasm, but they can be stuck to the membrane as well. And so that's where we're getting our idea of tracy. So we think of their different functions. We could also think of their things that they are controlling. So we're using transport for regulation, Receptors were for regulating and for communicating. Anchorage is there for structure. Cell recognition would be for communication, helping with regulation, connection, and communication would be those tight junctions as well. A lot of important things with our tight junctions. And enzyme activity, again, would be regulation. So they're <coughs> controlling uh, different chemical reactions inside of the cell. So again, uh, just think of Tracy and then try to think of all of the different specific um, roles that a, a cell membrane can be responsible for. Now, the last part of this video is we're gonna talk about cholesterol. And you've probably heard stuff about um, good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. And we'll talk about cholesterol and how it relates to your diet as we move into other uh, parts of topics. But when we just, in general, why does the body need cholesterol? What is the point of cholesterol? And so cholesterol, uh, as you can see here, is kind of in, in the membrane. Right? It's very, very small. That doesn't come up very well. Uh, maybe green. So right here, there's one. 
here's one they're very very tiny okay they're much smaller than a phospholipid even this diagram is showing them larger than they probably should be but they're very very small and they're stuck there inside the phospholipid and the, the, you know they're spattered spread out along different sides of the the bilipid membrane and they're basically there to help improve both the stability of the membrane but also help with its uh, fluidity so it actually helps hold the membrane together which we'll talk about how that happens in, a, in another slide uh, but it also helps improve the fluidity of the membrane helps keep it more fluid and more flexible so the idea of how it keeps it more fluid <coughs> more flexible you can think of this analogy so imagine you have a room full of people they're all wearing a bunch of puffy sweaters right or puffy jumpers uh, and so you could probably move through the crowd of people right so you know you, you might there'll be some friction there will be some resistance but you could probably slip through them super not you know too difficult if you're not wearing a jumper if you're just kind of you know wearing a shirt however what if we threw a few people in there that are covered with like a velcro suit and so because of that velcro suit uh, they're going to start kind of holding on to other people's sweaters and forming like this kind of meshy network of velcro suit person and sweater people and they're going to kind of kind of get stuck together forming these more stable junctions of people and so it might be more more difficult for you to move through that membrane and a little bit more difficult for the membrane to kind of break apart so uh, think of it that that's what cholesterol does right so cholesterol kind of helps hold the phospholipids closer together so that it's a little bit more stable but then it also stops them from getting too close together which also helps with its fluidity it actually does both things which is quite interesting so we're going to get into more details in the next slides so before we get into the details of what it actually does uh, just to give you an idea of its structure so you do have to identify cholesterol structure you should know what it looks like all right so uh, just like our phospholipids it has a hydrophilic head right it has a hydroxyl group this guy right here this OH hydroxide group means OH so it comes up a lot so it's good to start memorizing these uh, chemical terms okay chemistry terms so hydroxyl group right it's hydrophilic so that means it likes interacting with the water so it's always going to be what's facing outside in the bilipid membrane it's the one moving towards the outside of whichever membrane it is located in then next we have a cholesterol which is a steroid which is a four uh, rings kind of connected together so here's a ring and here's a ring and here's a ring and here's a ring and so these rings uh, kind of take up some space so a little bit more bulky than um, than a phospholipid which phospholipids chains here so these are really nice they're relatively you know wobbly uh, but they're they're relatively straight compared to the large bulkiness of a cholesterol and so that kind of helps with the fluidity so it, it kind of gets in there and kind of breaks apart the um, the phospholipids stops them from getting too close together we want them to be close together we can hold them close together but we don't want them too close together because then the membrane becomes too rigid and the membrane could break really easily so you have to make it more st stable by also helping it to be more fluid so this big bulky uh, set of rings is really going to help with that so we got four rings of carbons and hydrogens and those would all be hydrophobic because carbon and hydrogens are not charged and then we have a little bit of a hydrophobic fatty acid tail which would be nonpolar here um, in this last part okay and so you can kind of see it drawn there all right so these sections here uh, there you go these are all going to be uh, hydrophobic and nonpolar. So that means that they're all going to be located in the middle of the membrane, right, in the nonpolar region, where the hydrophilic section, right, is going to be located on the outside uh, in the hydrophilic area so that it can interact with, with water. Okay, so it's very similar to the idea of a phospholipid, but in some ways it's smaller than the phospholipid, but it does take up more space. It's a little bit wider than a phospholipid, which helps with giving it the properties that we're going to talk about next. So we need to talk about how cholesterol contributes to the fluidity of a membrane, but in order to talk about that, first understand what we mean when we say fluidity of a membrane. And so a membrane is a solid structure, but a membrane also acts kind of like a liquid in some ways because it can change positions very easily and it's very, very flexible. 
Uh, I would try to tell students to imagine the idea of uh, imagine that you have um, a swimming pool. And so maybe you guys have, have seen a swimming pool like this before where you have the water. And a lot of times they do this for outdoor swimming pools that, um, that are heated during the winter. And so to help with the heating, to retain the heat, they put these little plastic balls on top. Right? They're about the size of your hand. Right? And so they just float around the, the surface of the water. All right? And they're there to kind of help stop heat uh, getting out of the water so that the pool is nice and warm uh, during wintertime if it's an outside pool. And so the thing is, is that these little balls here, uh, if you push them down, right, uh, they're going to shoot back up again, right? So they're going to kind of stay on the surface of the water. If you uh, threw them up into the air, obviously gravity would then just pull them back down again, right? So in terms of their up and down movements, uh, they're very limited, okay? They can't really go down because the water will push them back up, and they don't really go up because gravity is going to pull them back down. So they don't really move very much up and down that way. However, these, uh, these little balls in the pool are not connected to each other, all right? They are, they are um, just, you know, around each other, but they're not physically connected to each other. So that means that they can move laterally. They can move this direction, all right? Or if we're looking down on the pool, all right? So we're looking from above as a bird, looking straight down at the pool. We could see the balls and they could move this direction, they could move that direction, they could move this direction, they could move this direction. So there is some stability to it, all right? Because they cannot move up or down, okay, vertically. But they can move any direction horizontally. They can move, you know, on angles horizontally, right? And so the movement of the balls around the surface of the pool is quite fluid, but the barrier, the wall of balls uh, floating on top of the water is relatively stable and solid, right? So that's what we're talking about when we talk about the membrane and its membrane fluidity. So a membrane is very, very stable, solid structure, right? Moving through a membrane is quite difficult. It is very much a barrier. However, moving laterally okay along the surface of a membrane all right not through it but along the surface is actually quite easy and that helps the membrane um, be fluid and adjust the position of things so let's say for example uh, this transport protein right here right it's used for moving sodium ions uh, into the cell and so for some you know whatever happens there's a bunch of sodium ions over here in this region well, rather than make a new sodium channel and sticking it over in this section, the cell can have this sodium channel move along the surface through the membrane until it's in the right region and then use it to help move sodium into the cell. So it allows the cell to, uh, to move things around its surface, uh, which helps it, you know, adapt and deal with changes in its environment a little bit more. So when we talk about membrane fluidity, the membrane is a solid barrier, but it is fluid. It can be adapted along its surface. So we can move things along the surface of the membrane as it chooses to. Okay, and in some instances, we can move things across the membrane, but that's a little bit more difficult. Uh, we're going to need some type of transport protein in order to do it. All right, so the fluidity of the membrane comes from how easy it is to change shape, adjusts the size, and also to move things laterally along the surface, uh, both the outer surface and inner surface of the membrane. So this is the interesting dual role of cholesterol's effect on membrane fluidity. So remember that Velcro example? So cholesterol being mostly uh, hydrophobic and phospholipids having big hydrophobic sections. Hydrophobic things like to interact with hydrophobic things. Cholesterol can be quite uh, restrictive in how it interacts with things. So cholesterol actually reduces membrane fluidity in some situations. And so as the membrane is forming, or if the a membrane is increasing in size, for example, let's say that the cell is taking on uh, more liquid. And so if, as the cell gets more liquid, the cell is going to increase in size. 
that is going to be an issue for the membrane's structure. And so the membrane is going to start to get bigger and bigger. Well, if the membrane starts expanding uh, too much, it could start to break. And so then you could get a hole that forms uh, in the membrane. And then that's going to be a problem because then stuff is going to move in and out of that membrane uh, with no regulation and no control. And so that could disrupt the cell and uh, cause some problems. However, if we have a bunch of these phospholipids, so here's a bunch of phospholipids in our membrane, and we're looking down at our membrane. If we stick a cholesterol in certain locations, we actually increase the connection between the cholesterol and the phospholipids, which helps kind of hold them together. All right, so we, if the membrane is becoming too fluid, we add cholesterol to the membrane and it actually helps hold on to the phospholipids and stop them okay, from separating. So we can reduce the fluidity of the membrane if it's getting too fluid by adding cholesterol. Now, the other thing is that because cholesterol is kind of bulky, remember it has that, that four ring structure, it can increase fluidity though because it prevents phospholipids from becoming too compact, from becoming too close together. So if we have our phospholipids, right, and let's say it's getting colder, and when things get colder, they shrink, right? And the same thing happens with a cell. Cells shrink when they get cold because their membranes will also shrink because their phospholipids will start getting closer together, right? But we don't want them to get too close together because if things become too close together, they become brittle and they could break. So if we have a phospholipid, I'm sorry, if we take cholesterol and we stick them in between the phospholipids, because the cholesterol takes up a lot of space with those rings, it actually prevents the phospholipids from becoming too compact and becoming too close together. So then we in increase flexibility, increase the fluidity of the membrane by using cholesterol. So it's interesting that we have the same effect using cholesterol. We can reduce fluidity by holding the phospholipids together, but then we increase fluidity by preventing them from becoming too compact when, the, for example, when temperatures drop. So because of these dual properties, we are able to uh, regulate the stability of the membrane using cholesterol. And so that's one of the reasons why cholesterol is so important for your diet, all right, is that you need cholesterol to have stable membranes as you're going through growth and repair and things like that. Okay, so these have been your notes on this section. We're gonna talk more about the fluidity, the fluidity of, a, of the membrane and how we know the membrane structures are the way that it are, they are uh, in the next series of notes.